Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence today. Your presence, you are Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you for your love, and Lord, I'm asking that you speak to the hearts of your people today, to transform, to heal, to be our teacher. Allow your word to go forth in power with such an anointing upon everyone that they may be transformed, renewed, and healed by your love and by your word today. We pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are in Lesson 13, Days 2 and 3. In uh, last week's lesson, we were given an example on how to pray. Not what to pray, but how to pray. Recognizing who God is and who we are in the prayer of our Father. And asking God, our Father, to deliver us from the evil one. And we have that authority. And we are in a battle. And we have to pray that prayer to ask Jesus, to ask the Father to deliver us from an evil one, who is Satan, known as the devil. Our first point today is that understanding Jesus' power over evil, in light of his power, Jesus' power over evil, we know that from a previous week's lesson, that we also have been given power over evil. Jesus said, I have given you power over all the enemy." So we have authority in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit in us to take authority over the evil one. Now Jesus also said in John 14, 12 through 13, whoever believes in me the same works as I do myself, we also will do. We will perform even greater works, Jesus said. And we take to, that to mean quantity, not quality, because Jesus did everything. Jesus is speaking about deliverance here in this lesson. We're talking simple deliverance, not exorcism. Exorcism has to be discerned and turned over to an exorcist if that is the diagnosis if we're praying for someone. Now, our second point today is Jesus' talk of a wicked generation, a generation who wants a sign. And he says the only sign that will be given is the sign of Jonah. And Jesus says there is something greater than Jonah here, something greater than Solomon. Like Jonah, in a sense, Jonah's a type of Christ in that Jonah called the people of Nineveh to repentance. Remember Jesus' first words in his public ministry was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. He's calling us to repentance, to turn away from our sin, and that is what Jonah did. That's what makes Jonah a type of Christ. He called the people of Nineveh to repentance after being in the belly of the whale for three days. And Jesus told his disciples that he would suffer and die on the third day and be raised up. So Jesus has been preparing his disciples also. The call to repentance by Jesus would be greater than Jonah. His sign would be the forgiveness of sins for the whole world, for all people, for all time. And he is one greater than Solomon because Jesus is wisdom incarnate. God gave, Jesus gave uh, Solomon the wisdom that he needed because he is wisdom incarnate. He is wisdom become flesh and it is he who gave Solomon that wisdom. So there is one greater than Solomon, he says. But the Pharisees said, it is through Beelzebul, the prince of devils, that he casts out devils. Let's see what Jesus did. Luke 11, 14, beginning with 14. Jesus was casting out a devil and it was dumb and deaf. But when the devil had gone out, the dumb man spoke. And the people were amazed. But some of them said, It is through Beelzebul, the prince of devils, that he casts out devils. Others asked him as a test for a sign from heaven. But knowing what they were thinking, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is heading for ruin, and a household divided against itself collapses. So too was Satan. If he is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Since you assert that it is through Beelzebul that I cast out devils, now, if it is through Beelzebul that I cast out devils, through whom do your own experts cast them out? Let them be your judges then. But, if it is through the finger of God that I cast out devils, then know that the kingdom of God has overtaken you. 
So long as a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he is attacks and defeats him, the stronger man takes away all the weapons he relied on and shares out his spoil. So now, the Pharisees are saying, it is through Beelzebul, the prince of devils, that he casts out devils. So Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for ruin. A household divided against itself cannot stand. Now take note, miracles like this are an attack on Satan and on his kingdom. Jesus is speaking that truth that we have authority over all the enemy. And Jesus said, so if it's through Beelzebul that I cast out devils, through whom do your own experts cast them out? Let them be your judges. In other words, Satan does not cast out devils. And he says, just ask the experts. Jesus then said, but if it is through the finger of God that I cast them out, then know that the kingdom of God has overtaken you. The kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. The binding of Satan now is an eschatological concept. Remember, eschatological and es uh, eschology <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> means the end times. And we have been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven. We have been living in the end times. And that is why we need Jesus. That is why we need to take authority over the strong man that would bother us in any way. The strong man guards his castle, but when someone stronger than he attacks and defeats him, his weapons are taken away. So we can even take away the weapons of Satan. Jesus is the stronger man, and he is the victor. By his life, death, and resurrection, he overcame death and Satan. So just a little tidbit here, because you'll hear two words. Beelzebul means the lord of the prince of demons, and Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. They are both names for Satan. Okay, so let's talk for just a moment. How do we battle the enemy that wants us to sin and leave God through pride by yielding to temptation of the world? Um, I use pride as an example here because I think it's really interesting. Here's a little story about one man uh, who had uh, been a Catholic. He grew up a Catholic, but when he had higher education, uh, he told my husband, Kenny, uh, yes, he used to believe because he was a Catholic, but once he was educated and had higher education, he realized that there really was no God. And, <clears throat> but when he had lung cancer, he, he was a man on the golf course talking with Kenny and everything, and, and he knew Kenny was a believer, and so he said to Kenny, would you pray for me? And Kenny said, who do you want me to pray for? <laughs> who do you want me to pray to? I mean, who do you want me to pray to since you don't believe in God? And he, and he felt embarrassed, but he said, I want you to pray the way you pray. So, I think that this man was free of the cancer that he had through the prayer. And, um, yeah, so God is so good. Uh, he, he blessed him, and Kenny talked to him about Jesus. Why do we invite Jesus into our hearts? Last week we talked about ask, seek, and knock, but Jesus is also knocking on the door of our hearts. I would say if you have never invited Jesus into your heart before, don't go to bed tonight, don't go to sleep tonight until you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and send your Holy Spirit. Because every time we gather, we just don't know what God's going to do, but we know we need Jesus. So every day, every, every time we find a need, invite Jesus to come in to help you and to strengthen you and for whatever way you need. Remember that Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Now it's interesting. If two or more gather in his name, there I am with them. But if we don't gather in his name, then we scatter. That, I believe, is why fellowship is so important. That we gather to pray together. That we gather for Mass. That we, we are gathering community because we want to be present with Jesus. We want Jesus to be present with us. And how do we keep ourselves from yielding to the temptations of the world? 
first of all, I would say, keep in that relationship. Keep in that relationship with Jesus, continually inviting him to come in. Talk with him. Your prayer life is your relationship with him. You have a relationship with him. Tell him what you think that day. Tell him what your needs are. He's with you. He knows them anyway, but he wants to talk with you. And he just doesn't want you to talk at him either. He wants you to listen to him on occasion. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> I'm a big talker. But when you're struggling in any way, fix your eyes on Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise his name out loud. When you're in a spiritual battle or any kind of battle, and even if you don't recognize it's a spiritual one, when you're afraid, ask Jesus to steal you under the covering of his precious blood to make you invisible to the enemy. More than pray, praise Jesus out loud. That is how I battle. I was reminded when I was in the room praying just a little bit ago uh, of a time when I think I told you this story, but I was I had some cups in my hand because I carry up water every day, and the cleaning lady was coming, so I had to take all those cups downstairs and put them in the kitchen. And so I was I had all these cups, and and all of a sudden I thought something pushed me. I don't know, but I fell down the first flight of stairs, and Kenny was at the bottom of the stairs where the um, oh, the tile is, he was fixing the grandfather clock. And I fell, and the, the cups went flying, I could hear them crying, but I fell right down and slid down on the steps. And we were on our way to Mass. My makeup was done, my hair was cold, and I was ready for Mass. And anyway, when I fell, and Kenny, I could hear the agony of his voice saying, Oh, honey! He was so worried about me. But when, when I was laying there, I said, I think I'm okay, but I praise the name of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that I didn't slide down onto the cups and cut myself, or that I didn't do this. I just said, I praise you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. And Kenny helped me up, and I was, in fact, okay. I was a little stunned, but I said, we don't want to be late for Mass. So I ran upstairs, combed my hair again, <laughs> and we went to Mass, and I thought, you know what? I felt that as if that was a battle for me. It was a battle that I had to move through because I needed to do certain things, and and even though the enemy tries to come against us in any way, when we praise the name of Jesus out loud, let's say if you're afraid, you're in the house by yourself, you're afraid of something and you don't know why, just say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus. And I saw on Facebook the other day, which I thought was really interesting, this person was having one of those jewelry parties, and um, the lady was going to have a surprise for him. The surprise was actually she was going to have a discount on something. But anyway, she was going to show the jewelry, and all of a sudden, this man walks in with a hood and a mask, and, and, uh, and of course, the lady sitting there thought that this might be the surprise. <laughs> so the, the man says, with his gun, uh, get all your purses out. No. Pull out your purses and take out your money and whatever. And this one woman said, I belong to Jesus. She stood up and she said, in the name of Jesus, you get out of here right now. In Jesus' name, leave. In Jesus' name, he started backing up. He didn't know what to do. And then he turned around and he took off. Amen. Isn't that amazing? So Amen. the battle belongs to the Lord. And so we need to call on Jesus, the power of his name, the authority that he's given us is powerful. So call on the name of Jesus. That is important. And don't forget to put on your spiritual armor every day. Remember Father Bill gave us that talk at the retreat about our spiritual armor. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the, the belt of truth, and the gospel of the shoes, the shoes. And so every morning we should put on the armor, and invite the Holy Spirit to come, to be present with us, to help us. Sometimes we just need to talk to another believer when we're in battle and ask for prayer. Sacramental living is really a gift to be able to go to Mass, to adoration, to confession, to bless ourselves with holy water. I think I've said this to you before, holy water washes away venial sins to help you move away from the sin before letting uh, a toehold you, you put a toehold in your sin, and then all of a sudden you've got a foothold in that, and then pretty soon that becomes a stronghold in your life. Bless yourselves with that holy water, and it is, it is powerful. So, this scripture now is not to scare us, but I will read it to you. Our first pope, St. Peter, said, Be calm, but vigilant. 
Because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand up to him, strong in faith, and the knowledge that your brothers and sisters all over the world are suffering the same things. So we cannot forget that we have an enemy and we are in a spiritual battle. Jesus also warns us in 11:24, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it wanders through waterless country looking for a place to rest. And not finding one, it says, I will go back to the home I came from. But on arrival, finding it swept and tidy, this evil spirit, unclean spirit, goes off and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and set up house there. So the man ends up being worse than he was before. Notice I just said the man. I mean, you women, I'm sure that you have found yourself. So, <laughs> anyway, I'm just joking. Oh, so we don't forget we're in a spiritual battle. Jesus forewarns us about the danger of being once more defeated by Satan the devil, which would leave us worse off than we were before. Now, that's a scary thought. If we have been cleansed, let's say through confession as an example, uh, we need to now be filled with God's Holy Spirit. We've gotten rid of that uh, sin or whatever we've been in, and we need to invite the Holy Spirit to come in uh, into our hearts and into our souls. We do this by reading Holy Scripture, going to Mass, uh, receiving Holy Communion, by being in fellowship with someone by, uh, about the Lord, by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, by praying, and by using the example of our Blessed Mother. I want to just share with you how, if something is empty, uh, Kenny, uh, you all know mostly that Kenny had uh, surgery on his liver. He had the right side of his liver removed with a softball-sized tumor, um, and the doc and he also had his gallbladder removed. Now, when I pray for him, I don't know where to pray, so I pray for his whole tummy. And and so the doctor did say the empty areas where the tumor was removed and where his liver was removed and where his gallbladder was removed. Those are the places of danger. There, there's a danger of infection even up to six months um, because that has to heal internally. And so it's the same and physically. There was a danger for infection to come in. Spiritually, that represents the spiritual realm. If we leave something empty, the enemy can come in. If we leave our souls empty, so we need help. Um, there was a woman in the crowd then in this uh, message, um, and she says this, verse 27 and 28. Now as Jesus was speaking, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed the womb that bore you and the breasts you sucked. But he replied, Still blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That was a very powerful statement that Jesus made. Jesus said in response, even more blessed are those who hear the word and keep it. We hear the word sometimes, but we don't always live it or keep it. That was the Blessed Virgin Mary, though. She kept the word of God. Her basic attitude of soul was that she was faithfully living her yes. She put the word of God into practice when she said, let it be done to me according to your word. And so when we're battling, don't forget to ask for her help and intercession in your time of need. Now, St. Luke gives us Jesus' words here. And Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and puts it in some hidden place or under a tub, but on a lampstand so that people may see the light. You are of the light of the world. You're like a beacon in the dark. When we go out into the world, generally we go out in dark places, and you carry the light of Christ in you. What is that light? That light is love. It is compassion. It's generosity to help people in their need. Um, we need to be filled with that light. When we are light, God is glorified in our midst. Now Jesus, in this scripture, was battling hypocrisy cloaked in legalism. The Pharisees thought they were right, but they were hypocritical. Under the guise of doing good, the Pharisees were keeping the letter of the law, but failed to keep the spirit of the law, and therefore they closed themselves off from love of God and love of neighbor. Finally, the reproach that Jesus gave the Pharisees when he went to dine with them was this. You Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup of the dish, 
but inside you are full of extortion and wickedness. Then he said, but, now this is really amazing, give alms for those things which are within, and behold, everything will be clean for you. Almsgiving isn't necessarily money, that's part of it. But in the proper sense, it means realizing the needs of others and letting them share in what you have. If it is spiritual help they need, you can give it. If it's support of some kind, to someone needs a friend, if it's consolation, if it's fellowship and love. What do we have that we can give in the way of alms? Not so much alms like money, as I said, but giving of ourselves in love and compassion. And I do think our Pope Francis uh, tries to emphasize that. Give love, give compassion. Um, and that is, Jesus says, what will cleanse and purify us. Almsgiving includes all acts of mercy, including the forgiveness of sins. And I personally know that you all give many good, rich, wonderful, compassionate alms. So Jesus contrasts the outer cleansing of dishes and hands with the inner cleansing of our hearts. And so today we're going to ask that you share what has God done for you in your heart and in your life this school year at Women's Christian Fellowship. We want to invite you to give God glory today and praise. And so I will invite you up now and we will pray this prayer together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray uh, the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.